This week on the Marketplace of Ideas, a conversation about the decline, fall, and possible rise again of French cuisine with Michael Steinberger, longtime Slate wine columnist and author of Au Revoir to All That, Food, Wine, and the End of France. It's the Marketplace of Ideas. I am Colin Marshall. Journalist Michael Steinberger is Slate's longtime wine columnist, a contributing writer to the Financial Times, and a writer, or rather he has written for more publications than I can name in the time we have here. His new book is Au Revoir to All That, Food, Wine, and the End of France. Michael, welcome to the program. Pleasure to be with you. I read that subtitle, Food, Wine, and the End of France, and I get this mental image of... The European map with a smoking crater where once France proudly stood. I have to imagine your publisher was very happy with the impact that subtitle would have. Or did the publisher actually suggest it to you? Yeah, the publisher wanted it. Oh, okay. <laughs> they, want, they liked the idea of ginning up a little controversy right on the cover. <laughs> and uh, I can say that the end of France has caught the attention of some people in France. Um, <laughs> getting some feedback on the subtitles, let's put it that way. <laughs> yes, well, I've, I've seen a lot of subtitles in this line, I'll tell you, and it, that always is the story with these with these ones that are very bold, that the publisher loves them and the author gets some flack for them. But I have to say, we should clarify, this This book ends on a, on a happy-ish note for culinary France, correct? It does. I, I you know, The last part of the book is looking at some of the positive trends. Um, there are encouraging developments amid all the all, all the things that have been lost, all the practices, all the traditions that are withering away in France, uh, there are encouraging signs, green shoots, if you will. And I talk about those in the book um, because I think there are hopeful signs that, uh, you know, French cuisine is not uh, necessarily, you know, destined to to just uh, continue its decline, that there are uh, signs of a, of a potential revival. Now, before we get to the signs of life, we should talk a little bit about the the death, as it were. In the first few sections of the book, we... I should ask, how heretical is it to talk about the decline of French cuisine among non-French Francophiles these days? <laughs> well, you know, it depends on, on who, who, who you're among. I mean, you know, obviously there, there are um, a lot of people um, who uh, have great attachment to France and uh, who are, you might even say, emotionally invested in the idea that France is the place one goes to eat well and who are therefore very resistant to uh, anything that might suggest otherwise. But I think a lot of people, and, and this has been, you know, something very interesting for me, a, a lot of the feedback I've gotten uh, on the book has been from people who travel, have done a lot of traveling in France, and who feel that the book really sort of put together ideas that have been kicking around in their own heads for a while. You know, a feeling that things weren't the same, that things were declining, that one didn't eat as well in France anymore, that it was a lot harder to eat well than it, there than it was 20, 25 years ago. And so, you know, among a lot of, uh, a lot of Francophiles, a lot of people who've spent uh, time in France and who know France and French cuisine well, uh, I think there is a feeling that France has, uh, has slipped on a banana peel here and um, <laughs> that this book tells the story and, 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 and tells it uh, you know, in pretty um, comprehensive fashion. Might we say that among traveling Francophiles, or whatever we'll call them, that there was a creeping malaise when they were eating they couldn't quite pin down the source of? A lot of it, yeah, that, I think that's a good way of putting it, that there was, you know, you could, you know, 20, 25 years ago, you could roll into a town or village, and it wasn't so hard to find a pretty good meal. And now it can be next to impossible in some of these places to find something decent, to find even a decent baguette. <laughs> or croissant to snack on. So yeah, there there is a feeling that uh, things have declined in France. That uh, French cuisine has become far less reliable than it was in years past. Part of this too is that, and I think this is another part of the story, is that um, you know twenty twenty five years ago there was a huge gap between uh, how one ate here in the U S. and how one ate, could eat in France. And that gap has narrowed. It's narrowed in part because we eat a lot better here now. 
than we did 20, 25 years ago, the quality of the restaurants, and more importantly, the quality of the building blocks of cuisine, of the meats, of the fruits, the vegetables. Such an incredible improvement over the last quarter century here. That's narrowed the gap. And then in France, you've had a decline in these things. You've had a decline in the quality of the restaurants, a decline in the quality of the ingredients, the produce, and so forth. And so the gap is narrowed, so one doesn't have to go to France to have these culinary epiphanies anymore. And I think that's part of the story, too. And you describe a bit of a culinary epiphany of your own in the book, your earliest moments of of discovering French cuisine. But I want to get this straight. Now, the time the time that you, let's say, became a lover of, of French cuisine, that this was at the same time that American food was just not where it was at in any way, shape, or form? No, I mean, these were, you know, this would have been, you know, in the early 1980s, you know, these, the, there was still a time when I mean, we, we were starting to eat a lot uh, better um, for some of those um, pioneering French chefs who came over in the 50s and 60s. I mean, by the, you know, which, and the, that was a period that was truly the dark ages as far as uh, uh, food here in the U.S. went. I mean, things were vastly improved by the, night, by the early 1980s, but it was still the case that one ate a lot better in Paris or Lyon than one did in New York or Los Angeles. And so, you know, one still went to France to have those incredible experiences that couldn't be had at home. Now, how long a stretch did you get between when you discovered French food and between when you found yourself feeling this sort of Francophile's malaise? Oh, it was a good two decades. Ah. You know, and uh, as I talk about in the book, I was in denial for a period of time. <laughs> um, you know, in the late 1990s, mid to late 1990s, you started to see people talking about um, a decline in the quality of French cooking, a crisis in French cuisine, and I was um, in denial about it. Um, I, you know, as far as I was concerned, France was still the place one went, one had to go to eat well. And, uh, you know, i very ardent Francophile, so um, it was hard to own up to the possibility that things were slipping. But as I talk about in the book, a couple, uh, a couple of episodes, you know, a, a trip to Paris, discovering a, a favorite restaurant that was really, that had really uh, started to decline unexpectedly, a couple other sobering experiences along the way, and uh, suddenly, as, as I put it in the book, uh, the snails fell from my eyes. <laughs> and this is, as you illustrated in the book, all a very, well, all a mostly recent phenomenon. And during this whole time, during a wider span of time, the idea of the decline not of simply French cuisine, but of France, has been a, from what I can tell, a large part of the the general cultural conversation in France. Now, Within that context, I mean, was it like the food was the food was more sacred within that, and one didn't necessarily talk about that decline because the decline of France has been such a subject there? Do you know what I mean? I do. I think you know. I uh, I think the thing that my book does that you know somewhat different, and, and that takes the conversation a step forward, is that it puts food in the context of this broader decline. But it, it seems obvious to me that, you know, when you have this sort of general malaise, and it's been 30 years for, for, that France has been stuck in, in this malaise, um, food, cooking, cuisine is going to suffer alongside it. That's the argument I make. I mean, basically the gist of the argument is this, that um, France um, has been in a rut economically uh, for the better part of the last 30 years, and French cuisine has suffered alongside it. Um, this is very much an economic story. And so you know, I don't know that um, that people have avoided talking about the decline of French cuisine. They haven't. I mean, there's been a lot of conversation about it, but I haven't, I haven't seen any, anyone writing about, you know, how the decline of French cuisine related to this overall malaise in France. And it seemed to me anyway that it was uh, self-evidently part of it. I do want to know how this book evolved. What are the points? What was the point that you reached where you thought to yourself that this tying in of the decline of French cuisine with the French decline would need to become for you a large journalistic project? Oh, it was just something that, you know, I was sort of kicking around in my head for a while and then um I began to to think seriously about it uh in 2005 as 
France continued uh, stumbling down this path, and uh, <laughs> and um, the signs of culinary malaise just kept piling up. Um, it occurred to me that there was a book to be written here, and uh, yeah, because it really strikes me as uh, this is not just an important food story, but given how influential French cuisine has been, and I'm not just talking over the last 25, 30, 40 years, I'm talking about, you know, over hundreds of years. Um, this didn't strike me just as a, as a it, didn't occur, it didn't strike me as simply an interesting food story, it struck, me as a, it struck me as a really important cultural story that needed to be told, and so at a certain point, I just you know, realized there was a book to be written here, and uh, I decided to do it. You do start the book off with a potted history of, of French cuisine. Was that where you actually began your investigation to get the, the development of French cuisine so you could then find what maybe had gone wrong at some point along it, or was that, was that a separate track for your research? It was a separate track, and actually it was, it was interesting. I mean, the book, um, to go behind the curtains here, I mean, the book... Uh, Attracted quite a bit of interest when uh, I put the proposal out. Um, I think it was six publishing houses ended up um, bidding on it, which was very gratifying, very flattering, and um, had a uh, very interesting experience because my agent, uh, there, there was a lot of interest when the proposal went out, and he had me come up to meet with uh, various editors and um, met with one um, at one house with um, a very major figure in the New York publishing world who um, loved the idea and so forth. And he gave me a great piece of advice. He said, listen, whether you go with us or not, I would suggest, you know, because I, in the proposal I hadn't talked about, I hadn't talked about including a chapter, you know, going through the history, how France became this culinary colossus. Um, and he said, you know, whether you, you know, do this book with us or with someone else, I would suggest that you, you take some time in the book to explain how France got to be so good at food which was a great piece of advice, and a piece of advice I took. And so, you know, while I had a lot of information already, I mean, you know, this idea didn't, you know, didn't just occur to me. I mean, this was, you know, the idea for this book, you know, was based on a lot of the reporting I'd done already. I'd, you know, spent a lot of time in France, and so I had a lot of stuff in my notebook already before I even started the book. But um, it, I had not originally thought to do something looking at the whole history of French cuisine and, and explaining how the French got to be so good at food. And it was a great piece of advice, and I think it's a very useful part of the book. And it is something that indeed needs to be established before one can discuss a decline. One yep. must establish wh- wh- why it's, it's so good. And what, what, to your mind, makes French food so good at its best? Creativity, the, the care they put into it, um, Quality of the, the the ingredients that they that they they have. Um, France um, is a country that is um, I won't say uniquely endowed with you know, just amazing product, as chefs call it. But it's got some pretty darn good stuff. There is there is something to this notion of terroir, and France certainly has um, some fantastic terroir. You see it with wines, of course, but you also see it in the cheeses, um, in the um, quality of the poultry, the meat, the fish, all those sorts of things. I mean, so they're, they're working with a pretty good, um, some pretty good um, building blocks, um, shall we say. And um, you just have, you've had this incredible food culture that evolved over several centuries um, where, you know, they weren't just good chefs, but there was a, there, you know, cuisine was taken seriously. It was really, you know, an intellectual pursuit in a lot of ways. And, and, argued uh, and discussed with as much passion as you know, art, literature, politics, all these other things. Um, where to be a great chef, you know, was you know, to be a really you know, a cultural icon. And so, you know, you've got this amazing culture, this amazing intellectual edifice to go along with just the quality of the food they put on the table. So I think, you know, that's really what has always set French cuisine apart. And what also helped set it apart was they, you know, very much, you know, Thought as a thought cuisine, and this goes back you know, to Carême and then to Escoffier and, and and some of the major figures in French cuisine. They saw it as a as a way of spreading French influence around the world, and it and it was. What do you call it in the book? One of the, the most benign imperialism there ever one was. Of the mo- one of the most uh, benign forms of imperialism the world <laughs> has ever seen, and it's true. I mean, they you know Escoffier himself, you know, got this wonderful quote where you know he. 
that, you know, he has trained chefs, you know, and sent them all over the world to, to spread the glories of French cuisine, and, and so they have. And they've taught a lot of the world how to eat. There's the fact that we eat so well here in the U.S. now, it can be credited in no small part to the many French chefs who came over here in the 50s and 60s and 70s, really pioneering figures, opened restaurants at a time when, you know, this was a wasteland in a lot of ways. They, they cultivated an audience for their food, and they trained local chefs. They um, really played a, a, a very central role in kicking off America's culinary revolution, uh, the fruits of which we're enjoying now. And uh, this is something that happened in other parts of the world, too. And so you know, the French deserve a lot of credit for how well the rest of the world eats now. The idea of this French food culture that you mentioned where where food is an intellectual topic to be discussed as any other form of art and, and all that goes along with that. Is this a type of culture that remains unique to France, or has there been as much of a spread of that type of food culture as well as, as, well as the food itself throughout the world? It's something that remains very French. I mean, it's, you know, late in the evening they have talk shows on French television, and uh, Food is often a topic, and chefs are often uh, participants. I mean, and and they're talking about food in a very high-minded way. Um, <laughs> yeah, I saw I, I was, you know on a, on a trip to France uh, a couple of years ago. I was watching one of these shows, and they were having a very very intense debate about the, uh, the evils of fast food. Um, <laughs> there is still this rich um, gastronomic discourse in France. But you know what? We're having that conversation here now, too. I mean, people like Michael Pollan, um, you know, there is a very um, there's a very serious discussion of food and food culture here in the U.S. now, and this is something that, I mean, we've always had, obviously, uh, we've always had influential culinary figures here, um, and uh, but now you're really getting a very serious, high-minded discussion of food, um, and one might even say a very French sort of discussion about food. So, you know, uh, it's, no, it's no longer unique to France. A fascinating element, one that popped up two or three times in your book from those you spoke to, is that French, uh, France does have the food culture, but it has been difficult for them, evidently, to get young French people interested in it. Is that, is that truly the case? Is there a whole generation who's coming up resistant to this in France? Resistant, I don't know if it's resistant or just sort of indifferent. Um, you know, they've grown up um, in a very different world than their parents and grandparents. Um, fast food is everywhere. You know, McDonald's has truly conquered France, and we can talk about that um, later if you'd like. But, um, you know, you've got more than a 1,000 McDonald's outlets in France now, um, lots of other fast food. You know, you take something like wine. Um, younger French just have no interest in wine. Um, and, and it's perhaps the greatest source of distress um, to French winemakers who have a lot to worry about these days, but the fact that um, younger French just seem absolutely indifferent to wine um, is, is perhaps their biggest source of, of, of angst. Um, you know, you see it in, in poll after poll, the younger French think of wine as something that their grandparents drank. They want to drink beer. They want to drink uh, mixed drinks, cocktails, uh, no interest in wine. Food, there's just a lot of indifference to it. Um, you know, I had a very funny experience. I was interviewing um, at one point in the book, and I talk about this in the book. I was interviewing Alain Sendarens, uh, one of the great French chefs, um, and uh, he had a 30-something PR person sitting in with us in the meeting. And, uh, you know, Sendarens was saying, oh, you know, the young people will come around. They always have nothing to worry about. He leaves the room for a minute, and this his PR assistant turns to me and says, it's true. You know, people my age, we don't care about food. <laughs> None of my friends care about it. So I think there is a real problem. And I think, you know, while it is true that, you know, kids will be kids and, you know, maybe they'll come around later on, I think there is a lot of reason to be concerned about this generation of French youth and, and, and just how, how interested they are in cuisine and uh, how much they will do to preserve this wonderful gastronomic heritage. You mentioned a bit earlier the specter of McDonald's, which I think a lot of people in America, they think about McDonald's as being something that the French hate. And it, for, for some French people, as you quote in the book, that seems to be true for some. But you also mentioned how 
France is the uh, is the second largest market for McDonald's, and there was this one article in the Economist I remember reading that had this great opening, and that they said, you know, look to your left, you see McDonald's. Look to your right, you see Pizza Hut. Look straight ahead, you see a Texas style barbecue restaurant. Welcome to France, the cradle of anti Americanism. <laughs> and what is the contradiction going on here? It, well, it is the it is just the French par the real French paradox, I guess you might say. <laughs> um, you know, it's there. There still is. Um, yeah, we talked before about you know this rich gastronomic discourse, the, the, the sort of intellectual, you know, high minded discussion of food that one finds in France, and one still finds it. And in those high minded circles, it's still very fashionable to um, to deride McDonald's and the Malbuf, as it's called, junk food, the French pejorative for junk food. But um, the French have embraced McDonald's in astonishing numbers. Um, it is the second most profitable market in the world for McDonald's. Um, they've just done, a, a, the company has done an amazing job. And, you know, and, and as they explained to me, um, you know, the, the, the executives of McDonald's, I mean, initially, the initial appeal was the fact that it was American. I mean, the French have always had a love-hate feelings about America. I mean, a lot of stain for us, but at the same time, a real love of American culture. McDonald's um, hamburgers, I mean, that's a big part of American culture. And so there was, they embraced that. And more recently, though, the company, uh, the, 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 the novelty has worn off, and the company has really, you know, positioned itself as, as a sort of a French company. Um, happens to be an American fast food chain, but it's played up the fact that it's, you know, sources most of its ingredients in Fr that it uses in France. In France, um, Played up the fact that it's very family friendly in a way that traditional French restaurants, bistros, and brasseries are not. You know, the French, um, you know, have come to this, have come to McDonald's in just astonishing numbers. Um, they just really seem to be loving it, to quote the McDonald's commercial. <laughs> I want to get an idea of how much. McDonald's has adapted to what we've called the French food culture there. Because here, I think that even an enthusiast of McDonald's would say that it's not good food. It's not in any way, it's not in any way quality product, unless you count the, um, the speed with which it's delivered and the, the cheapness as elements of the quality. But is, is the food itself actually better in a French McDonald's? Is, is it stuff we would in America know as superior hamburgers or whatnot? No, I don't think so. Oh, really? I, I, I don't think so. I don't think I. I don't. I mean, there, there are things they've done in France to 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 Frenchify the experience, if you will, because as I said, they um, you had after the Jose Bové incident, and this was in 1999 when the um, militant farmer Jose Bové um, decided to bulldoze McDonald's in the in the city of Mio in protest of tariffs the U.S. had slapped on Roquefort cheese, a local a local product. Yeah, he becomes this anti-globalization icon, sort of a French folk hero. McDonald's executives in France realize they had a big problem on their hands. They de they decided, okay, we need to talk about what this company does for France. The fact, for instance, that it sources seventy five percent of its ingredients in France, supporting French farmers and so forth. So you know, you have um, a real uh, they they played up. You know, they decide they have to play up their Frenchness, and so they do. They they start this brilliant propaganda campaign to to showcase, you know, to, to call attention to how much product they source in France. They um, decide they're going to start. You know, they start um, every month. They have a different. They start using a different French cheese, you know, on hamburgers. So they're not using just American. You know, they're not using American cheese on their hamburgers, <laughs> but you know, they're using different a different French cheese every month for the cheeseburgers. Um, they add gin and yogurt. Um, they serve beer. That's the difference in the experience. Um, you can get beer at McDonald's in France. Um, so I suppose one could say that's very French. They have not gone to serving wine, and um, they say they will not do that because they do not want to be seen as trying to compete with bistros and brasseries. But there is, you know, there are some very French aspects of the experience. Let's put it that way. Even as an American, I can say they made the right move with that cheese alteration because American cheese sucks. <laughs> you can admit that. It's true. It's true. And, uh, you know, and, but they didn't do it, you know, you know, to avoid American cheese, but again, just to, you know, just to, you know, to appeal to, you know, to French hearts and minds because they, they, they felt they were in danger of losing them, you know, and in the aftermath of the Jose Bové incident, um, you know, they felt they really needed to play up, um, 
the, 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 the French aspects of, McDon- of the McDonald's experience in France. There's a lot of talk just generally about how a company like McDonald's or whatever large food conglomerate you want to name, and even in countries outside of France, when they go to another country and set up camp, that they are in some way killing or strangling or beating down the existing native food culture of that country. And in some ways, that is a compelling line of argument. But when I think about it, it d- does it not seem that for a foreign foreign fast food companies or what have you they can go wherever they want but their success the fault of that success lies ultimately with the with the say french consumer for mcdonald's in france right that's exactly right um no no one is forcing people in france to go to mcdonald's you know what what has happened and um as i talk about in the book is the you've got a very brilliant marketing strategy um by McDonald's in France, and its strategy was spearheaded by a Frenchman, uh, a guy named Denny Enneken, who did his job so well that a few years ago he was made head of McDonald's uh, for all of Europe, and who is believed to be in the running to head the company worldwide at some point, a Frenchman running McDonald's. Chew on that one for a moment. (laughs) But um, the strategy only worked because the French responded to it, the French public responded to it. And... Yeah, I think you, one can say that um, part of what helped McDonald's in France unquestionably was the economic situation in France. A lot of people um, have serious financial problems in France. Um, they, if they want to eat out at all, they need to go to very inexpensive restaurants. The bistros and brasseries are prohibitively expensive for a lot of people, pensioners, young families. Um, you're talking about a country with you know high unemployment, stagnant living standards, so for a lot of people, eating out, you know, the option has been McDonald's. Um, maybe not the most palatable option, but um, the most affordable one. And so, you know, McDonald's has unquestionably prospered because of the economic situation in France. And it was also benefited, and this is quite perverse, um, you talk about, you know, the role the French have played in, in you know, in this. Um, it benefited from a very favorable tax structure. You see, they had... They have a value-added tax in France, and it's levied on restaurant meals. Um, but they made a distinction between what were called gastronomic restaurants, which could be anything from the corner bistro up to the three-star luxury palace. They had a 19.6% value-added tax levied on those meals. McDonald's classified as a takeaway joint, uh, a takeaway establishment, and those uh, were taxed at only 5.5%. So you're taking what was already a cheaper meal to begin with, and you're apply- giving it a much more favorable tax rate, giving the French consumer all the more reason to want to go to McDonald's. Fortunately, the French government, after years of protests from chefs, um, decided this year to um, you know, make it one value-added tax rate um, across the board, and it went with the lower one, the 5.5%, which took effect July 1st. We'll see if this helps. This has been something that has really hurt you know, many French restaurants, and it's part of the reason for the decline, and we can talk about that more if you'd like. But, um, you know, McDonald's benefited from a very favorable tax structure. So, yes, I mean, you know, this, this was in a lot of ways an inside job, if you will. <laughs> Now, why would such an allegedly food-loving, restaurant-loving, fast-food-hating country like France levy a punitive, I mean cartoonishly punitive to an American's ears, tax on the very thing that they love so much, the restaurants? Good question. I mean, it's, it's, basically, um, all, all the European countries have value-added taxes, and you know, they're applied to meals, but France was a very punitive rate. and. Um, as I understand it, um, the reason it was put at such a high rate is because they were convinced in a lot of cases that chefs were cheating, underreporting <laughs> their incomes and so forth. And so that, that was part of the reason that it was put at such a high rate. And um, chefs will tell you it's been a disaster because um, you're talking about adding 20% of the cost of a meal. And it's, it's the price is embedded, that added 20% of 19.6%. Um, is built into the price of every dish on the menu. You know, it makes it, you know, made it very expensive to go. And certainly when you're talking about the higher-end restaurants, places that were not cheap to begin with, um, you're adding 20% of the cost of what is already an extraordinarily expensive meal. Um, you're really limiting your potential audience. A lot of people made the point you just made, that, you know, for a government that 
talks a lot about preserving French culture and then you know it talks about defending France's cultural patrimony. Um, they had a, a really silly way of doing it as far as taxes and restaurants go. Um, it showed something quite different than a desire to uh, to to preserve the culinary arts and and and, and to keep them uh, dynamic and vigorous. This strikes me as another in a long line, I would think, of policies that the French government has implemented to, you know, well-meaning policies in a way to preserve the, what they call the French way of life or the French model. The 35-hour work week is emblematic, I believe, of this, but that well-meaning policies, sure, but they also fail utterly. Now, is do they all backfire? I should ask, haven't there been any successes in these France-preserving policies that have been put down from the top? No, I don't think there have been too many successes. <laughs> you know, and part of it is, you know, I mean, look, you know, they make a big think about the language and preserving the French language. That's something they can't really do. I mean, English is the global language. I mean, that's just, you know, something they're powerless to stop. And I think one can say that, um, you know, the French have, have had a hard time adjusting to the fact that France just generally doesn't matter as much as it used to. Mm-hmm. It's not the power it once was. It's not the influence it once was. I've seen the same thing in, in Britain. The British have taken their decline in a bit more stride, with a bit more humor. I mean, they like to make fun of themselves and to sort of revel in their uh, diminished status to a certain <laughs> extent, poking fun at themselves at the, you know, the failures of their various sports teams and so forth. The French um, have had a harder time, I think, adjusting to their diminished stature and... Um, they don't, you know, a lot of this is just the way the world has evolved. I mean, you know, and, and, you know we talk about why they've, you know, lost um, so much influence. Well, I mean, they, you know, let's not forget two catastrophic wars in the 20th century. Mm-hmm. You know, just the loss of French life, um, you know, the, the cost in lives and, and, and economic costs. I mean, just devastating. And so, you know, it's a country that has lost a lot. Um, and, you know, it's it emerged, you know, a very diminished power. Um, and so, you know, but they've had a hard time adjusting to that. And uh, I suppose, you know, the fact that um, cuisine, the one thing they could hold on to, even there, they, they seem to be, their influence is waning. Um, that's, you know, a particularly heavy blow after all this. <laughs> <laughs> I remember seeing, and maybe you maybe you saw these as well, but there were these brochures printed up by whatever bureau or bureaus in, in France handle this sort of thing, the promotion of the French language. These pamphlets said something like, you learn French because it's the international language of business. And these were printed up in the late 80s. And I was thinking, <laughs> are, were they out of their minds? Exactly. Well, they made a valiant effort. I mean, you know, <laughs> give them credit for trying. Um, <laughs> That's, it is a bold claim. I can credit that, no doubt. Exactly. I mean, it's, you know, you know, and if it seemed ridiculous uh, 20 years ago, well, you know, now it's, uh, I don't even think they would, I don't even think even they would try to make that claim at this point. Um, I hope not. And, uh, you know, so yes, I mean, they, you know, they take great pride in their culture, which is, it's a wonderful thing. And it's, it's, you know, a culture that, you know, over the, over the sweep of history has been as influential as any other. I mean, just, you know, it's, the country that has enriched the world in so many ways. Um, so they have a lot of reasons to take pride in what they've, in, in this culture, in their language, um, their literature, their, their, their film industry, and their culinary arts. But, you know, the world has changed, and um, they've been uh, slow to recognize that, to accept it. And, um, you know, you can see this very clearly in the culinary realm. For those just tuning in, this is the Marketplace of Ideas. I'm Colin Marshall. Find our complete interview archive online at colinmarshallradio.com. My guest is Michael Steinberger, longtime Slate Wine columnist and author of Au Revoir to All That, Food, Wine, and the End of France. We'd be remiss in not talking specifically about French wine. After all, it is a component of your subtitle, but it's what so many associate with France, specifically the wine. And I want to get this figure right. I don't want to mess it up because it is so surprising and seems like an exaggeration. What has been the drop in in French wine consumption? It has declined over 50% uh, in the last 40 years. That It just sounds incredible on the face of it that that would happen in France. What are we, what are we pinning this on? Well, it's been a couple of things. First of all, I should stay off at the top that, you know, it started at a quite high level. They were prodigious drinkers <laughs> in the 1950s and the 60s. What 
started the decline were the same things that sort of, you know, put the multiple martini lunch out to dry here. <laughs> I mean, you know, changing social mores, changing work habits. You know, it, so, you know, in France, you know, it, you know, it used to be, you know, customary to for people, business people to go out for lunch and have a bottle of wine over lunch. Um, that began to change. Then what you had in the early 1990s, um, because the French drank so prodigiously, um, you had a very, very high rate of drunk driving fatalities in France. And uh, it was a real public health menace, to put it mildly. And so the French government decided that it needed to, to crack down on this and put in place some very draconian drunk driving laws that were very effective. They brought down the rates, but you know, at a certain point... Um, what happened is, and it's a bizarre, bizarre thing, perhaps one of the more bizarre aspects of contemporary France, you've had over the last 10 years or so, the French, successive French governments, French politicians, have become increasingly prohibitionist, which is just absolutely bizarre <laughs> to about France. I mean, all sorts of restrictions on how and when alcoholic beverages can be talked about, you know, bans on Internet advertising. Um, you had a case in 2008, I believe it was, um, where a, um, a newspaper in Paris was fined for running an article before the holidays about champagne. I mean, just, you know, that's sort of standard. You know, every newspaper and magazine, you know, come November and December has articles about champagne because it's the season for champagne. Um, this was considered a form of advertising, and the paper was fined. Um, you've got you know, uh, basically a neo-prohibitionist mindset now in France, um, and Sarkozy is kind of representative of that. Uh, this is a French president who doesn't drink, which is in itself sort of crazy. <laughs> and so you've got... Um, you've got a, a French political establishment that is really at war with French viticulture. And the interesting thing is where they used to make a distinction between wine and other alcoholic beverages because wine was considered so central to the French sense of identity, part of France's cultural patrimony. They don't make that distinction anymore. And it's this very, very strange thing, and it's had, it's had an effect. Um, you know, you had declining consumption already, but it has, con- you know, consumption continues to plummet now. Um, the French public really has taken this message to heart and um, is moving further and further away from wine. And it's, uh, it's a disaster for lots of producers in France um, and just, you know, a very distressing thing for anyone who loves wine uh, to see this fabulous wine culture sort of uh, waning. Has this increasing prohibitionism of the French state come hand in hand with, or has there been a... a commensurate decline in the amount of subsidies the government has historically given to wine producers? Well, they, they've had to stop the subsidies uh. because as part of the you know, part of the European Union regulations. Um, you know, the subsidies were given and given lavishly in years past, um, too much so, and that's part of the pre- reason you have a situation now in France where you've got too many wine producers. Many of them are... Um, basically destitute these days. You've got a, a real wine crisis in France. In fact, it's called La Crise Viticole. It's hit a couple areas, particularly hard Bordeaux, uh, Beaujolais, and the Languedoc region. Um, you know, in the Beaujolais region, they think 30 to 50 percent of the producers may go under over the next few years. You know, what's, these people are, are being hurt both by the advent of robust competition from abroad and this huge decline in consumption in France. So the market has dried up for, the, for a lot of these producers. But the fact is you have too many producers, and you have too many in no small measure because French government lavished huge subsidies on people in years past um, on wine producers. Um, they made it possible. They sustained a lot of people who probably shouldn't have been in the business to begin with. The subsidies encouraged a lot of people to get into the winemaking business. Um, and so, you know, when you've got now um, this huge decline in domestic consumption, uh, more competition from abroad, and an end to the subsidies, you've got the makings of a real crisis. And um, you've got, you know, really thousands of, of small producers in France who are going to be going under over the next few years. And it's a very sad situation, but obviously um, an unavoidable one. So now, I mean, the only subsidies they, that, that are available now um, are via the European Union, uh, via the European Union, and these are subsidies. Um, they're basically paying winemakers in France to rip up their vines because 
they you know need to get these people out of business. They need to get a lot of these more marginal vineyards, you know, ripped up to reduce production because they're 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 making much more wine than there's a market to buy. This sounds like another one of those French policies that seems to be well-meaning, but in fact turns fatal. The way the subsidy has come across in your book is that they're they're really less a help to to growers and vintners than they are a form of cruelty in a way. Well, I don't know if they're cruelty. I mean, you know, created jobs, create you know, kept people going. But at the end of the day, you need to be able to sell your wine. You need to be able to find buyers for your wine. And you know, if you can't do that, you can't be in the business. And um, the subsidies, uh, you know, sustained a lot of people who shouldn't have been in the business to begin with, um, you know, who should have been doing, looking for other lines of work, um, you know, who either were working um, in, on inferior land or just didn't have the ability or talent or ambition to make decent wines. And, you know, that um, created a lot of economic inefficiencies that are now being wrung out. And it's a very painful process, um, but a necessary one. And, uh, so yeah, I mean, the subsidies in the long run were not a very good thing for French winemaking. And there were other problems, too, other, other decisions taken by bureaucrats that also helped, that also hurt the French wine industry. But the subsidies were certainly something that, in the long run, did not help. We've illustrated a picture in this conversation of, of a France where... There is an enormous food culture, but the kids don't care about food necessarily, and where we th- think of wine in the rest of the world as being such a so central to France, and yet drinking has declined fifty percent in the last forty years, and you know where where people flock to McDonald's and and yet hate it. There's 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 so much there's so much that feels like it needs to be explained about the about the difference between image and substance here i mean it's not it's not just hypocrisy though i mean there's there's more at work here right oh no it's not it's not just hypocrisy i mean these are you know these are you know changes uh, you know in a culture that that are, have been produced you know by you know economic choices that have been made um and and so you know it's not it's not it's not hypocrisy here. I mean certainly with the wine issue. I mean this is just you know this is just something that's happened and it's happened for a variety of reasons. One can say that um, you know the French can be accused as can people anywhere. I mean Americans have their own hypocrisies. The French are hypocritical, I suppose. One could say about fast food. You know, applauding Jose Bove and other people resisting uh, fast food with one <laughs> hand while scarfing down Big Macs with the other. But, you know, every, every country has its inconsistencies, its hypocrisies, um, and the French certainly have their share. But I think, you know, a lot of these other things are just changes that have come, you know, with the way the world is now. And then, you know, um, you know it's harder, for instance, for people to linger at the table now than it was in the past. I mean, you know, France, of economic necessity, you've had you know, you know, a lot, you know, more and more two-income households. That means less cooking is being done at the table, less less cooking is being done in the household, less time is being spent at the table. This is sort of French cuisine. Um, there's no question about that, but, you know, there's sort of no way of, avo- of, of avoiding it. Well, more important than the problems that have that have happened in the past, I suppose, now are the, as you called them, green shoots at the beginning of this interview, the, the reasons to be optimistic about French cuisine. And now, as a lover of French cuisine, what do you see that makes you heartened for the future? Well, I think there are certainly a lot of people in France who realize that um, things, they, they, they've taken some wrong turns here and that, you know, that some of these traditions, that, that this rich gastronomic heritage is itself in peril. The one thing you can say, for instance, we were just talking about wine, obviously huge problems for the French wine industry, but it is still the case that the very best French wines are still the benchmarks for winemakers around the world. And that France, in my opinion, and I don't think it's a very controversial one, continues to produce more of the world's great wines than any country. Um, you know, it is still, for that thin upper crust of, of very top French producers, you know, the top producers in Bordeaux and Burgundy and so forth. I mean, they, business has never been up until this economic downturn, this global economic downturn. Business had never been better. Um, their wine's never in, more, in greater demand. So, you know, and when you're talking about the very best French wines, things are fine. What you're seeing in the culinary, in the food realm um, are some encouraging developments. Um, you, you've seen um, a lot of younger French chefs who, um, you know, in response to the economic situation in France, the fact that um, it's 
become very, very difficult to run really high-end restaurants. Um, the fact that people, French diners, don't really want to pay, haven't, don't have the money to pay for these sort of opulent restaurants and really don't have the desire to eat in them anymore. So you've seen um, a lot of young, very talented French chefs who said, okay, we're going to do something very different. We're going to do high-end cuisine but in a more casual setting. Uh, it's, a, it's a movement that has even acquired a nickname. It's called Bistronomy, and it's, situa- it's, it's centered mostly in Paris, and it's, it involves some of the most talented young French chefs there are. And I mean, I don't want to create the impression that France doesn't produce great chefs anymore. It produces incredibly talented chefs, as it always has. And you've got now a group of them who, are, um, who said, okay, you know, we've got this crazy economic situation here. Um, it's become very difficult to run restaurants. So we're going to go and, you know, we're going to, Get away from this luxury model, the Michelin three-star approach, where you know you've got very opulent restaurants that, you know, and you have to charge hundreds of euros per person to make it work. We're going to go. We're going to open in you know slightly um, less posh parts of Paris and other cities. We're not going to have people in tuxedos serving you. Um, just for a casual, convivial setting. And we're going to serve you know really amazing food in this setting at a price people can afford. It's a really, it's a, it's proven to be a master stroke. Um, these are some of the best restaurants in Paris, um, wildly popular, and um, they are finding a new way of doing really high end cooking, really incredibly refined cooking, in, in a way that you know people can afford, in a way that people want to eat now, and so that's a very encouraging development. And you've got you know other young chefs. I mean, some of these chefs cook in a more classical idiom. Others. Um, in response to the rise of Spain, which has really sort of planted France as the as the culinary world's lodestar, as the, the intellectual hothouse of haute cuisine, younger French chefs saying, "Okay, you know, we're not going to let the Spaniards do this to us. <laughs> we're shaking off the you know this great the, the the weight of French culinary tradition and coming up with some very innovative cooking. You know, I, it's too soon, too early to say that France is on the cusp of another nouvelle cuisine revolution, but you've got some very innovative cooking being done in France now, and for the first time in a number of years, and that's an encouraging development, too. And this is something we've barely touched on, especially given the importance that it has in your book, but the the weight of the Michelin Guide and (laughs) the three stars. Now, it seems to me, the impression I came away from your book with is that at least the young French chefs that we mentioned, they seem to have essentially told that establishment to take the three stars and shove them. I mean, they, not so much, not, not so directly, but they don't seem to care about enduring what needs to be endured to gain and maintain three stars. Yeah, and a few of them have actually literally told Michelin to go shove them, <laughs> that they don't want the stars, they don't want them in the restaurant and so forth. Um, that is absolutely true. Um, you know, what what you've seen, I mean, they're, they're you know, the, the, the consensus that has formed over the last half century among French chefs is that um, the difference between a two-star rating and a three-star rating is not the food, but the level of luxury you provide. And so, you know, the chefs who wanted three stars, and, and this idea really took root um, really in the 1960s. 1965, Paul Bocuse, the famous Paul Bocuse, wins, his, wins the third star for the first time, and he still has it now, um, all these years later. Um, the story goes that he won the third star after doing very expensive renovations to the bathrooms of his restaurant. Um, and so ever since then, French chefs have believed that to win a third star, you have to provide uh, a setting as opulent as the food you serve. And so they've, you know, in many cases, taken on incredible amounts of debt to provide, you know, to build these luxury palaces. In some cases, some of them have bankrupted themselves. And what you have now is, you know, because... You know, fewer and fewer French restaurant goers have the means or desire to pay for these kinds of meals. And you've got an economic situation that, you know, has made it just so difficult to run these kinds of restaurants. I mean, it's, just, it's, it's, it's a disaster for many of these, um, you know, many of these luxury restaurants. It's just the economics just doesn't add up. In response to all this, you've had, you know, this, the younger French chefs, chefs who in a different era would have been, definitely going for the two- and three-star ratings and, and who have certainly have the talent to be at that level who said, you know what, we don't want this. This is crazy. You know, we're going to, you know, we don't want to, you know, become slaves to bankers. We don't want to do this sort of thing. We want to be in the kitchen cooking 
high end fair, but at a set, you know, at a price people can afford, with the kind of setting people want these days. And you know, if Michelin, Michelin, you know, they can either accept this or not. But um, we're not playing for stars anymore, and Michelin is scrambling to keep itself relevant as a result. Now, when you're actually in France, and if you're taking a look at the guide, and you see a three star restaurant that you could potentially visit that you never have, is that still enticing to you, or is it more of a well? That means that means this this is the uh, this is the old regime. You know, is is it is it as do the three stars draw you personally as much as perhaps once they did? No, they don't. Oh. They don't. Um, I'm still intrigued. Um, you know. And it's still the case that winning three stars is a big deal. I mean, this is, you know, it's like winning an Oscar. Um, you know, it's, it, that's really what it is. And it still makes headlines. You still hear about it around the world if someone gets promoted to three stars. And so, yeah, I mean, there is that. I mean, the curiosity is still there, but um, I certainly don't take it as a given that the food is going to be good or as good as I want it to be if for that level and price. Um <laughs> You know, it may be that I've just, you know, become a little jaded or it just may be that they, they just aren't, you know, I, I've learned, you know, from experience that, you know, a three-star rating isn't quite the guarantee you'd like it to be. Um, I, I'm not as drawn to it anymore. And I think that's true for a lot of people. I think, you know, restaurant goers, and it's true in France, it's true in the U.S. Um, you know, you go into restaurants in New York, how many people want to be in ties now? <laughs> no one wears ties anymore. I mean, people just want a more casual setting. They want great food, but they want it in a more casual, convivial setting. Three stars are still, you know, places that, you know, are just, you know, with the, the white tablecloth with, you know, dozens of people in penguin suits hovering over you. <laughs> I just don't think people want that anymore. And, you know, I, I, it's not something I am particularly drawn to myself these days. If not the three stars, what has supplanted that to you as an indicator of a superior French eating experience? Oh, that's a tough question. I mean, it depends <laughs> on what I'm in the mood for. I mean, listen, I'm still there are still restaurants that serve you know classic French cuisine, and there are days when I'm definitely drawn to that. Um, you know, French cuisine um, in its you know, classic form, when it's done well, is still you know that's still. A great treat. I mean, it's such a great pleasure. But I also think that there are, um, the French have always been good at incorporating influences from other countries. Um, that's, yeah, some people would say that's really the, that's really the, the genius of French cuisine, <laughs> of taking ingredients, taking ideas from other countries, and um, making them French. And I think, you know, you, you see a lot of um, young chefs now in France who travel widely, much more widely than their culinary forebears did. Um, who are incorporating all sorts of interesting elements and who are, um, you know, creating a, a, a 21st century French cuisine. And some of them are doing it better than others. Um, you know, it's an experimental process. Some, some dishes are going to work better than others. But I think that's, that's something that interests me a lot right now is, you know, just, you know, who, who are the people trying to push French cuisine forward? And, and, and how are they doing it? What are they producing? And I think that's, you know, that's, to me, ultimately a lot more interesting than um, most of the three stars. Because one of the things, one of the problems with the three stars, too, is, you know, once they get to three stars, they feel that they shouldn't change a thing. <laughs> that, you know, they should, you know, lock in what they've got. Um, and, and so the, the, creative, the, the, the creative spirit sort of dies a little bit when that third star <laughs> is, is awarded. And so it's, you know, the young chefs who are not going for stars, who don't have stars or don't have three stars, who are doing, you know, the most innovative cooking. And I think that's quite interesting, too. The book, once again, is Au Revoir to All That, Food, Wine, and the End of France. Michael Steinberger, thank you so much for taking the time to join us on the program. Thank you for having me on. This has been the Marketplace of Ideas. I've been Colin Marshall. Our theme music is by Ben Althaus. You can check out his site at benalthaus.com. If you have any kind of feedback whatsoever, feel free to send it on to Colin at ColinMarshallRadio.com. Thank you for tuning in, and we'll catch you next time.